Hello, fabulous Facebook friends. I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Editor of Interior Design Magazine, and I'd love to welcome you all to Product Live. This is our inside look at the products and trends grabbing the industry and in real time looking at the minds behind the design. So this week, our mind is Aisha Bursell. Thank you so much for being here. We're so I'm so excited to have you here, by the I'm, way. I'm Super excited to be here. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to start out. So you and your husband, longtime partner, BB Sack, and your studio, you describe it as a human-centered design and innovation studio. So can you tell me a little bit about what that means? So first I, I know that must be a time. Sorry, <laughs> the hard I'm like hard-hitting <laughs> questions yeah. right out the yeah. bat. Hold on. <laughs> first things first. Yes. So I'm hoping, BB. I hope you were watching. Yeah, BB. we want to say <laughs> hi to you, by the way. <laughs> He's in Dakar, Senegal, and then um, I'm hoping that also my parents are watching in Istanbul, Turkey, oh. and my friends in New York on the West Coast, as well as in Istanbul. So, okay, so right. very Hello, international. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. We have a global show today. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, the thing is, BB and I, um, basically fell in love at work mm -hmm. and then decided that you know this was so much fun to be able to work and and were you at together. somebody's firm that you guys were working at so else's had, studio um, i had my own design studio in new york okay and i was invited to do a project for renault the french automobile mm -hmm. manufacturer and they um, they wanted me to do a concept interior design for them from the perspective of an industrial designer. Okay. And I said, great, but I know nothing about cars. Mm -hmm. It really interests me, but I need somebody from your side to tell me what I can and I cannot do. So can I have a collaborator, a mentor? And they said, well, great idea, we'll send you BB Sec and you're going to love him. And you really did love him. And, and exactly. And then vice versa. Apparently they told Bibi the same thing. And then so we started by uh, an office romance. Okay. And, uh, and then thought, well, this is great. We can work together. We complement each other's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bibi had been designing automobiles. He has like four cars on the market. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he's very like... Uh, he knows how to solve complex problems, and on, I am a conceptual thinker and a okay. systems thinker, and then we just kind of brought it together, and we thought we want to work with um, large companies um, doing industrial design, and, um, but we want to be ambassadors for the user. Mm -hmm. So how can we solve problems for the user and make their life a little bit better? That's what you know, drives our passion. And then in terms of the collaboration process between the two of you, like, does one person start and the other one comes in, or it's always the two of you conceptualizing together at the same time and problem solving with the product? It's kind of like a dance. Yeah. So sometimes I lead, sometimes BB leads. Okay. And um, we have different passions. BB is very passionate about the value of design mm -hmm. in um, Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm very passionate about you know developing systems and bringing new solutions mm -hmm. to old problems, mm -hmm. and so um, but I'm more of a conceptual thinker, and if you can believe it, Bibi is the dreamer. Okay. So Bibi will often say. So you're the grounded one, the grounded and he's one. up dreaming away but it yeah. obviously you guys find a really happy medium somewhere in between yeah he'll always say and you know a lot of people <laughs> if you, our <laughs> friends know this he'll always say if I were alone in my garden and he'll say it in French you know mm -hmm. and I I'll roll my eyes and I'm like yeah, <laughs> you're not alone in your garden mm -hmm. so you know <laughs> That's the dynamic. Okay, yeah. that's great. And I was also curious because obviously you're Turkish, mm -hmm. um, you know, born and raised until you came came to New York for Pratt, correct? And yeah, then obviously, my masters, yeah. you know, BB with both, you know, growing up in Paris and Senegal. Right. Like, do those? Does your background have an influence in terms of like also how you guys are designing or what you're designing? Absolutely. I'm uh, glad you mentioned it because um, I think. When you're like us, you know, immigrants, mm -hmm. once you've left your um, home country, mm -hmm. you, you can't help being an outsider. You're always mm -hmm. an outsider. And mm -hmm. um, it gets to a point where, where I've lived in New York most of my life. 
And so I'm an outsider now, even in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not a complete uh, insider, insider here. here either. And it's a perfect position for designers, same thing for BB, because mm -hmm. um, we are outsiders to most of our clients, which allows us to see things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's this combination of our creative thinking and often asking the questions that they might not ask, mm -hmm. um, you know, in kind of being um, ignorant in a mm -hmm. way, and then bringing that and learning very quickly and coupling that with our clients' expertise. Okay. So, and the other thing is, um, you know, I love dichotomies, and it's this insider-outsider, um, we're a small innovation firm, mm -hmm. most of our clients are Fortune 500, so it's this small, very agile firm mm -hmm. working with large corporations that have a lot of capabilities, and then different, a very global perspective, um, this combination of being a woman designer together with a male designer in mm -hmm. um, different cultures, all of it, it um, I think, gives us a very holistic view of things. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you, we invited you on today because um, of your partnership with Herman Miller. So yes. you had a new collection overlay that launched at Neocon this June um, and was just published. Yes. So it was published in our August issue. But, you know, this partnership with Herman Miller and we um, res started with Resolve, correct? And yes. when did this come onto market? So Resolve or Overlay? Resolve. So Res let's start with Resolve and Absolutely. kind of speak towards... This, by the way, is like a dream come true for me. Oh, yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> so Resolve came out, I think it was in 2000, okay. where um, things were very different back then. You know, there was so much optimism. The economy was going very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had just uh, worked on Resolve for three years, and the idea was, um, you know, technology was really becoming um, kind of part of the office environment, and um, it begged the question, like, with all this technology, people can work anywhere, mm -hmm. why do we still come to offices? And this idea, the idea was that we're still coming to offices to be social, to learn from each other and interact and gossip and talk. And, mm -hmm. um, and so Resolve was very much about connecting people together. Mm -hmm. And then actually, while I was walking here, I was thinking, you know, what's interesting about Resolve is it's kind of like the parent to overlay, but mm -hmm. in the sense that the metaphor that I loved using for um, Resolve and that guided our thinking for Resolve was that um, an office system is like a stage set mm -hmm. for the performance of work. And like a stage set, it should be able to change mm -hmm. and um, take on different per performances. Mm -hmm. And so now overlay is almost like all of the backdrops mm -hmm. for that stage, you know. Um, and I only had that thought, you know, sometimes you work on something, like I've been working on Overlay well, so for Overlay four years. Overlay is like, you know, Resolve 2.0 in a way. In a way, yeah. yes. In so, a way. It, ha it has a similar DNA. Okay, so for Overlay, um, so you just said you, you worked on it for four years. Yes. So did. in development, so like... It requires in patience. And three years for Resolve. <laughs> no, of course. And the it's fact a, that you, you, you really stuck with it and you guys... But obviously it just speaks to how thoughtful you are in terms of really understanding, you know, the challenges that there are in the workplace and how to come up with these solutions that are appropriate or multiple solutions because obviously it's a... You know, it, yeah. it, 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 it has so many pieces. And how many pieces does it have, in fact? It actually doesn't have a lot, a lot of pieces, pieces yeah. which is very intentional. The, the yeah. whole idea being, how can you make more with less? Okay. So I always say when you design a system, you need to have um, kind of like enough, but not too much so yeah. that you can kind of count it with the mm -hmm. fingers of your ha two hands. Yeah. So that you can remember. It needs so, to be like streamlined. Like how streamlined, streamlined can you get it? it so, exactly. Because I remember even exactly. reading, going back to Resolve, I think it, um, I was reading the background about it and how like m normal systems have like 300 like pieces and you got Resolve down to like less, less than, than 20. 20. Exactly. And like the fact yeah. that you were able to get something, which shouldn't, it doesn't seem complicated, but you really made it more accessible for the designer. Absolutely. And that, that was very intentional. Another piece of it was like um, to make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have um, 
you know, less than 20 pieces. Um, we took out anything that was not needed. We used all the materials um, intentionally and honestly. So there's mm -hmm. no material that's not functional mm -hmm. in either resolve or overlay. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there's nothing there that's just for decoration. Mm -hmm. So that meant that um, resolve, for example, um, had a savings of one third the weight of traditional systems. And it's also so. in terms of budget and cost, correct? It Absolutely. also makes it more accessible for yes. designers and their budgets when they're working on projects. Yes, it really is like higher performance and lower cost. I mean, what designer does not want to hear yeah, that? It, <laughs> and that's what I mean with dichotomies. I yeah. love um, so, solving mm -hmm. dichotomies so that you know, less is more mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, it looks very um, stable and long term, but it's something that you can quickly update. And it's, well, we'll talk about yeah. it in overlay. So overlay I, is kind so, of like. So I, I definitely want to talk about overlay. And part of, you know, something that I love about you and I'm a huge fan of is your Thank illustrations. You. Oh, yes. And so you gave me eight specific steps in terms of like what the process was. Yeah. And so um, do you want to give us like a, a quick like little anecdote about each of the eight steps and like I, I what will. it means? Because oh, your illustrations and you brought like your yeah. sketchbook. So everything. I did. I wanted every... to show this to. And you have a favorite pen too, right? I have a favorite pen. <laughs> that you so, like to use. All, all you need from my perspective okay. is you need a Bravo pen. Yeah. Um, which <laughs> has a very smooth line. And then you need a sketchbook. and. Um, and I call these my um, brain on paper. Brain on paper. So th this is how I think. Yeah. And if I'm not um, sketching and drawing, mm -hmm. um, I, I cannot think, basically. It, it, it's just, um, and I think a lot of creative people know this, that you get into the flow as you're drawing, mm -hmm. and somehow the ideas go from here mm -hmm. to the tip of your well, pen. Well, it's nonverbal communication, it's right? Visualization. It's visualization. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're visualizing the future based on what you know today. And mm -hmm. so th this is So the process <laughs> begins. The okay. Process so begins the process is... begins with somebody at their desk working and you say disturb, don't disturb, headrest. Yeah. You know, and it says workplaces driver's seat. Um, yeah. so this is really using the metaphor of a driver's seat in mm -hmm. an automobile. Okay. And saying, you know, when you're driving an automobile, so wait, wait, by the way, we're getting back to the car metaphor from like uh, how you guys yes. originally <laughs> met, you and BB. I love that. Yeah, Eileen, I, that's the first time I. Um, well, you made me think about yeah. that. It's perfect. <laughs> so it's that idea of you know you are in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. You know what you're doing. You have an expert, and you become more and more an expert the more you do it. Just like um, when you're working at your computer. And so, and you concentrate. So, how, what are the, and everything you need is at your fingertips. So, what mm -hmm. does that mean? Mm -hmm. And it was really looking, helping us think about the driver's seat in an office. Mm -hmm. So, that, that's, that was one of the beginning. So, then the next step was thinking in scales to see the big picture. Yes. So, th this is one of my um, actually favorite techniques. Okay. When I'm trying to think about something and I, don't quite know what the answer is. I mean, here I had no idea what the answer was. Um, so I start making scales, and scales are like, what's the minimum of something and the maximum of something? What's the most expensive of something? What's the mm -hmm. least expensive of something? Mm -hmm. What's the smallest version, the biggest version? And so these are scales uh, of, um, for example, the top one is, um, What's your minimum privacy element, mm -hmm. which is which are your headphones? What's your maximum privacy element? A private room or a, yeah, a door. meeting space? <laughs> yeah. A door, exactly. Yeah. What's the minimum of your display is your phone. What's the maximum of it? It's this huge picture window. Mm -hmm. So it's these ideas. Then you start to think, huh, well, in a system, you actually have the ability to scale things. You, mm -hmm. can, you can make something smaller, you can make something bigger, you can make something less private and more private. So you start playing with those ideas. And so that, that speaks to that. Okay. And then creative thinker equals chef. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I have great admiration for chefs and people who are in the kitchen and mm -hmm. um, how they bring different in ingredients together. Mm -hmm. And today we're really asked to be incredibly creative because you know we're living in a v world of VUCA. There's mm -hmm. you know um, 
constant uncertainty, things are changing very fast. So how do you respond to that? Uh, well, you take different ingredients and you continuously combine them in different ways. So it, it's a good metaphor for how we work today. Mm -hmm. And I was, again, trying to think, you know, um, in an office space, if you're doing creative work or um, contemplative work, how do you bring the ingredients together? What are your tools? What's your stove? Mm -hmm. And then what do you serve people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Deconstructing our notion of boundary. Yes, so these are all different kinds of boundaries, whether it's your monitor, your laptop that mm -hmm. becomes your boundary because you're behind it, mm -hmm. all the way to a curtain or a wall. All the different, again, this is um, in a way looking at different expressions and scales of um, a boundary. Okay, and also like transparency and... Very, yes, absolutely. Transparency, yeah. solid, yeah. Um, more or less acoustical. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, Ooh, maybe I should just also add, a lot of times in design, when we're designing experiences, um, you need to create the feeling of something mm -hmm. with a, without the need to be incredibly literal about it. So, for example, in Resolve, the idea of having a canopy over your head provided this feeling or experience of safety for people. Mm -hmm. So also looking at, like, how could I bring different pieces together so that together your experience mm -hmm. becomes you know, so where you, you can feel personalize safe, it. exactly, yeah. or you can feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so it's looking at those things in relation to each other. And it, it's also a lot based on the type of work someone is doing, correct? Absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, sometimes when you want to do heads, heads down work, you want that intimacy. So you want to feel like you're covered and in your own yeah. space, whereas maybe something more open, depending on you're more social or depending on what you're talking about, right? The topic at hand. Correct? Exactly. I mean, sometimes I feel like your day is, and certainly my day is almost mm -hmm. broken into those chunks where early in the morning it's very much alone work where I do my creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And then past nine, it's almost all social. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of the day, you come kind of go back, go to, back into yeah. yourself and plan your next day. And mm -hmm. I, yes, I, yeah. my day is exactly the yeah. same. <laughs> so I'd call this one planes, trains, and cafes because I know it was like you were talking about where people get their best thinking done, correct? Yes. So um, you all know this, but uh, to me, this sketch is really a turning point where mm -hmm. I started to understand. Mm -hmm. um, well, one thing that I love, among many things I love um, with Herman Miller, I mean, we've been working together for 20 years. so. It's, um, and it's great to have partners like that, that you have yeah. longevity. So you, you, you guys start speaking the same language and vocabulary a little bit in order to solve these issues or work together and be able to. It's like family. Yeah, you know? family, so, yeah. So um, in part of what I love about working with Herman Miller is they really want to be challenged and provoked and kind of how can, how can we think about this differently? And to me, this drawing was... Um, this turning point in terms of understanding what people need in offices. And um, that came from like simply observing people where they work and realizing that a lot of people do their best work in trains, planes, and cafes, mm -hmm. um, including myself, but also my friends. I mean, uh, in people we've interviewed. And we're, there's something about like being in a plane or a train where you are seated and you have some micro elements that create a boundary for you mm -hmm. but then you have this macro mm -hmm. kind of the fuselage of the um, mm -hmm. the plane the the train car or the cafe walls mm -hmm. that give you a sense of your neighborhood yeah. um, and so and we love that environment and one of the key things is that in those environments we're not alone mm -hmm. we're alone together yeah so and you want that feeling that I'm doing my own work, but I'm together in a community. You of get a, I was going to say you it's kind of have a temporary community that it, you can exactly. be a part of. And, and so that um, not only informed kind of like what this system was going to look like, but mm -hmm. also what's the acoustic quality of it? Because we realized that in these spaces, people didn't need and didn't seek 
complete acoustical privacy. In fact, they've told us that they want to have some... Um, the activity or like it, the sense of... Exactly, them. some ambient sound. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, and the key to that was, the critical point to that was, I don't want to understand what the other person says. So, but I do want that's a buzz. Exactly. Once you get into somebody else's conversation, yeah, you, you, know, lose, like, you, know. you lose your own. Exactly. So, so that that, that um, was one of our um, guiding design principles for mm -hmm. like how can we recreate these conditions mm -hmm. um, with our own system. Okay. Yeah. So the next one is the monuments of tech, and this one I know uh, you mentioned you were. Um, sort of inspired by somebody else's book, correct? Or... And I'm trying to remember, and I apologize. But it, <laughs> no, uh, it's all right. I just had a, um, a moment, like, I can't remember the writer, and it'll come yeah. to me after our conversation. Of course. It... But it was um, a New York Times article by an incredible um, tech writer yeah. um, who wrote about monuments of tech, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, mm -hmm. Google, all these amazing Silicon Valley companies. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so taken by the article that I basically visualized all the elements that were um, kind of talked about in the article. That okay. These are based, it's almost like a deconstruction of monuments of tech, mm -hmm. that they all have a main street, a cupcake store, and this is true. We were yeah. just, I, I was just. Or like in our, see, our, <laughs> our monument of tech here at Sandow, we have an ice cream, base, an ice cream truck, let's just say, because really? we get ice cream in the afternoon. Nobody else out there is supposed to know. <laughs> no, just, so, uh, you know, you ice cream back is my three. favorite thing. Oh my gosh, come back so, at three. <laughs> or stay till I three. I am coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and we, I was actually just at um, Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I'm um, part of Marshall Goldsmith's um, 100 Coaches. Okay. And we spent um, four days in Silicon Valley actually visiting a lot of these companies. Uh, and, um, you know, um, Google, Pinterest, um, uh, Intel. Yeah. And it's just like that. So again, like which one of these elements um, we should incorporate mm -hmm. into our own monument of tech? Okay. So what's interesting about overlay is one of these ideas is that the um, vertical walls have become the new desk. Okay. We now work on these screens yeah. and on walls and we want to pin up things and we want to have messages on walls yeah. and we want to see our purpose yeah. displayed. Well, it's also and easier so. to share amongst the community, your temporary community, is if it's like yeah. up on the wall versus down in front of you, correct? And even with our team, if we want to think through something mm -hmm. um, together as a team, mm -hmm. you know, we take out the flip chart and yeah. we start drawing and everybody writes and draws and yeah. then it almost is a cue into like it, we're thinking this together mm -hmm. so that that and that I think is I mean white walls are I mean they're important it's like the communal brain in a way right exactly and everyone could sort of add or you know just their create it's like the it's like the thought bubble right and everyone could sort of add to the, you know themselves what's happening within which is it. you know again goes hand in hand with this idea of um, we're living in creative times mm -hmm. and we're constantly problem solving and and the, there are tools for that and mm -hmm. most of them are vertical and you know you draw and you sketch and you do graphs mm -hmm. and, yeah. okay so, so the right. next one because you've now brought it up several times so I you did, love I resolving dichotomies yes <laughs> <laughs> yes so <laughs> and here they are so the, yeah um, you know one Herman Miller has uh, this philosophy of a living office. Mm -hmm. So this intersection of living and office to me is a dichotomy between uh, the human experience and architecture. And mm -hmm. overlay is really at the sweet spot of those two things. Okay. Um, and you know, the other piece of it is there are people who use the office so individual users, mm -hmm. but then there are people who design the offices mm -hmm. who are your you know, our designers readership. and yep. uh, our readership. readership and mm -hmm. architects. And the office needs to be a solution that is in harmony with those both sides, uh, where the designers and architects find themselves in their own um, expression mm -hmm. um, because they are creating an environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the system. And the end user needs to feel like I've been honored, you know, somebody thought about me. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, this notion of honoring the user is really, really important um, to me and again to, to Herman Miller. And this inner outer, yeah, okay. uh, when you do a boundary, 
you have an inside and an outside naturally, so how do we use that? And we okay. often um, would overlay talk about um, you can have a very creative, messy inside, yeah. um, but the outside could look very tidy, organized, mm -hmm. and you know, most offices, they don't want to show um, you know, the, the, the work. The work. The work. Because so, the so work can be messy. It, so it's really not saying either or, mm -hmm. but and. So yeah. acknowledging, yes, you know, I need to make a mess on these walls yeah. to be able to think creatively, mm -hmm. but not everybody who comes into the office needs to see that. So how do you manage mm -hmm. that dichotomy? No, and it's really interesting because I, I think some people are, you know, don't always think about the exterior, you yeah. know, of these. They just think about the interior, and I think it's important because, you know, if you know a small group is in the interior, majority of people are on the exterior, yeah. correct? Yeah. So it is important. Yeah. Um, so the last one, so <laughs> deconstruction of solo, <laughs> and like obviously this feels a lot different than your other sketches, and like what is the meaning of each of these? Yeah. This is the intellectual scale. Yes. <laughs> slide. <laughs> so, the, you know, again, people who know our work know that we have developed our own um, thinking process, mm -hmm. design thinking process, which is deconstruction, reconstruction. And the whole idea is you need to deconstruct what you know to be able to reconstruct it in a new way mm -hmm. um, and hopefully in a way that really is um, differentiated and brings new value. So th these were the deconstruction um, uh, you know, panels that we developed. And the way we do it, the, you can deconstruct something in m multiple ways, but one I love is to think about what's the emotion, what's the physical, what's the intellect, and mm -hmm. what's the spirit of something. Okay. And that way you know that you've covered all the different grounds and, and perfect for work because there's so much emotion at work. Mm -hmm. We try to cover it up, but it's one of the emotionally, most emotionally rich um, environments, social environments you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And so bring that out. And so what do you do with that as a designer? And the physical qualities of it, obviously the, the architecture and the furniture and the environments you create. Um, the intellect, all the intellectual processes that you go through in whatever work you do. And the spirit of it is really important. Spirit is all the things that are intangible, mm -hmm. but that serve a, a bigger purpose than the individual. So, mm -hmm. um, and what I love is millennials are very, very attuned to the spirit of you know, their work and mm -hmm. their work environments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in a way, I feel like I'm an, a millennial um, in, in that. Um, I think it's really important to um, display the purpose of your brand, mm -hmm. of your company. Um, display and live it. Mm -hmm. So how can we as designers of systems mm -hmm. provide you ways to do that? Okay. So. We can only go so far. I know, the, and the I rest. realize. No, but you know, it's always about this idea of collaboration. You know, it's obviously a collaboration between you and Bibi. It's a collaboration between you two and Herman Miller. Yeah. But then it's also, you know, the sort of relationship between, like you touched on earlier, the interior designer, the architect, yeah. and the product, and how they're going to use it, and then ultimately the product and the end user. And so there's always these relationships that are happening, and they're important. And you I'll have to be aware of them. And all of that is kind of pulled together in an organization. So the, the organization, the mm -hmm. CEO, the leaders, mm -hmm. and the kind of environment, work environment that they want to create, all of it. So it's their facility managers. Yes. So it's a multi-user um, mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. And in our goal is like, how can we make it right and purposeful for each one of these people? Mm -hmm. And that's where the, um, the office work, you know, designing work becomes so interesting. Yeah, but then, you know, there's also this idea where things are sort of customizable, right? Yes. So it's the interior designer taking sort of the kit of parts in a way and deciding to, based on who their client is and their needs are or the ind for what individual spaces that they need that they can create something that really helps them because it's all about problem solving, like you said. So. Um, you know, there are these various solutions and going back to what you were saying, like thinking about both the interior and the exterior of the exactly. space um, and how they can be utilized. And so in this notion of backdrop, so mm -hmm. you could have a very formal backdrop um, and that's where the 
some of the more formal materials come in. Mm -hmm. um, but you can have an incredibly informal backdrop that's mm -hmm. very playful. Mm -hmm. And so there, that's where some of the informal digital printing and uh, different things come into play. Mm -hmm. um, curtains come into play mm -hmm. for something a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. uh, wood slats, we were Which really is, excited yeah, to wood slats bring here. wood slats in. Something so more natural. Is something nice. more natural. And, um, and it actually makes you feel, like going back to this idea for Herman Miller about this, like the living in the office, like, yeah. you know, because it does have this very sort of home feeling when you're, you kind of think of your shades and like sitting in front of a window, because I know you, you, you talked about a picture window before as yeah. being sort of, um, sort of a large boundary. And, and that, so. That's the ultimate luxury. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can almost feel like you're right, you're sitting in front of a window here while you're actually getting your privacy and your intimacy to make a phone call or to do some heads right. down work. And that, what's interesting about the different materials then is once you start to um, create, again, a backdrop mm -hmm. for those materials, um, you also create a scale of not only form and color, but mm -hmm. um, you know, pricing as well. So you, you have the choice to say, well, this could be the really young, mm -hmm. um, you know, affordable version, and then you can scale it up to more and more upscale and mm -hmm. uh, refined and precious. Mm -hmm. So I'm always interested in, in also those relations of, um, and it's very welcoming of different kinds of work. So you could be working as a team, you could be ideating, you could be doing a workshop, mm -hmm. you could be sitting by yourself in a living room setting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, how do you bring those different kinds of experiences and settings mm -hmm. um, into one um, kind of, neighborhood in mm -hmm. a way um, and that at the end of the day that that was very intentional with overlay that um, it could take on different characters mm -hmm. because you're creating as an architect and and a designer you're creating different experiences yes. well I think you guys are incredibly successful but Thank before you. we end <laughs> I wanted to kind of talk to everybody and because in addition, obviously, to you know the product design aspect of the studio, um, you have both a book and a course. It's um, Design the Life You Love out there. And it would be really great to actually tell people how this came about, because obviously it came about in sort of a particular moment of time for you, correct? Yes, it did. So um, thank you. Um, <laughs> so Design the Life You Love, well, I'm really proud of this because it, uh, you know, we just talked about products and systems, which mm -hmm. is as a product designer. I mean, I love designing products and systems. I fell in love with the human scale of industrial design when I was, I think, 16 years old, and I've been doing that, you know, ever since. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I love about design, the life you love, and these days we do a lot of design the work you love, which in a way. Uh, kind of parallels what we just talked about, mm -hmm. is the, um, teaching people how to use design process to design their lives and work mm -hmm. without any products. And so it's pure design without the intermediary of product or systems or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it's you as the user of your life okay. um, together with your life and work. Okay. And how using design process, how could you take what you know today, deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it into what you can imagine and what you love. Something that excites you mm -hmm. as a future vision. And once you're excited, um, you really, people go out of their way to make that happen. So, um, and that, it, it always makes me think, it makes me laugh. Like, no, I know nobody's going to come to me, come up to me and say, overlay has changed my I, life. You know? <laughs> but, but people, this does but change their But it does, they just don't know who to thank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying that. Yeah. But this, this is, what I love about it is it empowers people to literally transform their life, mm -hmm. especially, in it, especially in moments of transition where they don't quite know what they need to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it came, you were asking where it came from. It came from a moment in my life where um, I was going through in 2008 when the economy crashed. When everyone was struggling at that we, time. And yeah. I think people and were trying to 
figure out what to do next, right? Exactly. It, obviously, the, the rules of the game had changed, and we were all like, okay, so um, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. and, um, and even though I am a designer, it, you know, and I'm used to solving problems and to making change, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of difficult and different, challenging when it happens in your own life. And so my idea was like, I had just developed um, deconstruction, reconstruction as a design methodology and set of tools. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I am a designer and I have a process. What if I apply these to mm -hmm. my life? Mm -hmm. um, and I've always thought um, that my life is my biggest project. So it felt kind of like, a, okay, treat your life as a design project. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and I was talking to a friend of mine uh, about it, Shirley Moulton, and she had um, Academy of Life, um, teaching people lessons you don't learn at school. Okay. And she said, that's a great idea. Why don't mm -hmm. you do a workshop? I was like, okay. So Shirley. So how many years later? <laughs> so 10 you. years later? Exactly. 10, 10 years, years later. later um, still, still teaching the course to people. Still teaching the course. And it's not just for designers, correct? It's actually not for designers at all. It's for mm -hmm. everyone. You have a life. You yeah. can do this. Yeah. Uh, and you have, uh, you know, you work. You can do this. So mm -hmm. it's, um, and we found, I started with life. Um, but I've also found that for a lot of people, you know, 80% of their life is work. Mm -hmm. So it's a very natural transition mm -hmm. to, well, how do you design your work as well? Mm -hmm. And then how do you design your work as a team? Mm -hmm. So it now is kind of like um, there are a lot of corporations that are asking us to, you know, help us design our work. Okay. Uh, and then... You know, the, the work we do with Herman Miller is almost taking that and mm -hmm. bringing it to the um, product design realm. So that's great. They're, they're all kind of... Yeah, everything is interconnected. Yeah. But I, I thought it was it's really like, lovely to kind of bring up the fact that, you know, you did this book and you did this course because for a lot of, especially the young designers out there, that even as an established designer, there are hiccups in life, correct? Oh, yes. But it's really, you know, how do you sort of embrace those challenges and like actually use it to like move you forward and how do you adapt with it and that, you know, these challenges can happen to anybody and I feel like you know you're now imparting this knowledge on to the rest of the community um, yes. so everyone obviously either get the book yes. or take a course yes. you know but um, Aisha I just want to say thank you so much for being here it was so great I loved you know talking and I of course I'm so passionate about your drawing so but thank you for being here today thank and for you. everyone out there please um, stay tuned for next week installment uh, Mark McManaman is going to be talking some trends about uh, reissues so stay tuned for next week thank you thank you thank you